Welcome back. I'm Cito with Mass Conversations. Thank you so much. God has been so good to me. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Today, I'm going to share my story when it comes to what I was dealing with when it comes to my heart. I had atrial fibrillation, SVT, and A flutter. Some people say AFib, subventricle tachycardia, that's the second one, and, and, and A flutter. In 2008, my heart would race probably once every year. It would race and I learned how to control it, hold my stomach, take deep breaths, drink some cold water, and usually after 30 seconds to a minute, it'll subside. My, my rhythm will get back to normal. And I didn't really tell anybody. I, I don't know why. I, I didn't really discuss it with, with, with anyone at the time. I did speak to my father when it first initially happened. And I was at work. I'll never forget. I was at work. And I told my dad. I was like, I called him up on my break. I said, Dad, I don't feel good. My heart was racing. I think I'm about to let my managers know. He says, hey. He says, don't tell your, your, your manager because you got a pretty good job. And at the time... I had a physical job and I guess if they found out if I had heart problems, they would let me go. So he's like, don't tell anybody, just wait till tomorrow or when you get off, go to the emergency room, get checked out. I said, okay, not a problem. I go to the doctor to go get checked out. They'll put the EKG machine on me to, to, to measure my heart rhythm and they'll say, hey, sir, everything is fine. Your heart's in good health, you're a young man, and we don't see anything here. Just make sure you're eating good, and 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 also make sure you drink a lot of electrolytes. So I stacked up with a lot of electrolytes and Gatorade, things like that, and I thought everything was fine. That's what I thought. And then until 2012 hit, that year was it was tough. It was. It was a tough year because leading up to that year, my heart would race 2009, maybe four times a year, eight times a year, 2010. You guys get the point. But 2012, it was racing at least three to five times a week. And at this time, I was letting my wife know, like, hey, like, I just, I, I'm having these heart problems. She's like, need to go to the doctor. And I'm stubborn. I don't know if you guys are like me, but I'm stubborn and I didn't want to go to the doctor and I was paying my insurance every month and I just never went. It's almost as if you're paying for a gym membership. You're paying, but you're not going. So one day I'm driving, I'm driving and my heart just takes off and I had to pull over. And I'm sitting there like holding my chest and it's almost as if when that happens, you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain. This is my thought process. Because now my eyesight is, is foggy. It's hard for me to breathe. And you can I can feel my heart just pumping at my chest. So I pull over. Calming down. Have my AC on full blast. On cool. Trying to calm my heart. And eventually it calms down after two minutes. And I was dealing with this in the beginning of 2012, and and it, and it was just ridiculous. I thought that that's this is how my life is going to end up, just having heart problems. I didn't know how to fix it. So one day, I said, "You know what? I'm going to leave my house because at the time I didn't want to leave my house. I didn't want to leave my room." Because the, heart, the, the heat outside will make my heart race. The different noises and the different vibrations will make my heart freak out and race. And I was afraid. I was afraid if I go out to anywhere, I'm not going to have anybody around me to help me. Or I could be driving and things could get worse. So I chose to stay home. And I was, I was just... It's almost as if you're living in your body, but you're in prison. Every day was a Monday that it felt like. You know, everybody will wait till, hey, it's Friday. I'm like, well, it's Monday to me because I can't go anywhere. So one day I said, you know what? My wife and I, 
we're going to go out. I'm going to I'm going to put my mind to it. We're going to go to a comedy club. We're going to go downtown. We're going to eat and have a good time. It was probably right around maybe November, give or take. It was a little, it was a little bit cold outside. Um, to me, it's cold in Florida. And we decided to go somewhere to eat first in the area. And I was having a hard time breathing a little bit. But I thought it was because of my asthma. But I will only use my asthma pump maybe once a year. So I decided to hit my asthma pump and f for whatever reason, within five minutes, my body starts having, the, having this tingling, weird tingling sensations through my body. And I was feeling a little bit lightheaded and I looked at my wife, I said, hey, we need to go, I don't feel good. So we get down into the car, she drove. She says, let's go to the hospital. I said, no, take me home. Let me relax. I'll be fine. We're almost home. And all of a sudden, my legs, they get cold. And, and at the time, I don't know if you guys, well, ever seen those, them shows where when they get cold and you're almost thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. I guess that's the sign. And I was in the passenger seat like this, crunched up. And I was, cr I was trying to crunch or tighten up my chest so my heart would stop beating so fast. And I called my mother. I said, Mom, I think I'm dying. I don't feel good. She said, just hold on. Just hold on. I'm going to go to the hospital. Now, the hospital that's near my home, I don't feel like I get the best care there. But the other hospital, which is 30 minutes down the street, the best care, hands down. But... I'm closer to my home. I said, just take me there. So while she's, she's now she's speeding. She's like a bat out of hell. She's speeding and I'm looking out the window, clenched up like this and my, everyone's calling my phone. My father called my phone. I pick up, I said, hello? He says, are you okay? I said, no, I, I feel like I'm dying. And I hung up and I'm looking out the window and everything was like a haze. I saw it was almost I saw the trees that was moving so fast, but I really couldn't focus because my eyesight it wasn't working correctly. So I didn't really know what was going on. So I'm still on the passenger side like this, not knowing what's going on. Cause I felt like one if I just relaxed, I knew something was gonna happen. I didn't know what, but I knew something was gonna happen. So I stayed like this. So we're almost at the hospital and I see the red emergency sign, but I couldn't really read the letters of the sign. So once I, I realized we were getting closer to the, to the emergency room or the sign, I just let go. I said, God, whatever happens is going to happen right now in this parking lot. And once I let go, my hands were like this. My whole arms, my body was shaking. and My teeth were chattering. And I couldn't stop it. And that has never happened to me before. And the only thing I remember is somebody opening up my passenger side door, picking me up out the car and putting me in a wheelchair and reeling me into the hospital. They gave me blankets, everything. And the doctor, he said, hey, you know, what's going on? I let him know I was having heart problems because at the time I wasn't diagnosed. Like nobody knew what was going on because every time I get to the hospital, no one could catch it. My heart was already in rhythm and I was getting aggravated. So they so they ran their test and they, they found nothing. They said, are you on drugs? I said, no, no, sir, I'm not on drugs. I don't, I don't smoke, I don't drink. Um, I drink. I drink a little bit of wine at the time, but that was it. So they said, hey, I want you to go see this cardiologist. He's a good cardiologist in his hospital. So my wife says, hey, you need to go see somebody. It's, it's, it's about that time. You can't live like this. So I said, okay, let's go see this guy uh, in two days. I went to go see this guy. I'm not going to mention his name because it just wouldn't be right. But I went to go see this cardiologist and they gave me a heart monitor machine to monitor my heart. 
So I'm wearing it. And he says, hey, take this blood thinners. It's called Metropolol, I believe. That'll help you. That'll help you through your daily activities. And, and I'm feeling good about myself. You know, the doctor's telling me, you know, this, this pill's going to help me out. This, that, and the third. So I'm like, okay, cool, doc. That's what I'll do. I went home the next few days. I took the medicine. And, and I called the doctor. I said, hey, can I work out? He says, yes, you can work out. I get to the gym. And within like 15 minutes, I'm seeing stars. And, I, and, I, and I'm trying to like rub my eyes, rub my eyes. And I'm like, this is not normal. Seeing different colors and different specks pop out. And I left the gym and I get to the car and my body's like sweating. Like it's overly sweating. And I was only in the gym for 15 minutes. So I call my dad. I said, hey man, I don't know if these pills are working for me, this, that, and the third. He says, I've been meaning to call you. He says, someone at my church, their their daughter had a had a procedure. And it was called catheter ablation. I said, what's that? He said, it's something where they go inside your body and Dealing with, dealing with the electrical part of, of your heart. I said, but, she, but he said, guess what? After pr the procedure, he said, man, the young girl, she's doing backflips. She's living her regular life. I said, that's what I need. So I did my research. I said, okay, this could fix me. I went back to the doctor to let him know this, this pill is not working. And his first response was, let's try something different this time. Let's try this drug called Molt Moltac. Now, mind you, we're in 2012, and this drug has only been out for maybe three or four years. And he was like, hey, it's a new drug. You know, it, it has a lot of great reviews on it, and I think you should take it. I said, well, doc, you know, can I've heard about this procedure called catheter ablation. You know, can you guys actually give me the procedure? He says, well, you know, we have to go through this protocol first, because we can't just go into the procedure and you need to take this drug and see if it works and let me know and, and get back with me in six months. So I go home and the Lord was speaking to me. He said, don't take that drug. Don't take it. So I Google the drug, Moltac, and so many people have died off this drug. So many. Now, I'm not saying anything as far as it's not a good drug, but I'm telling you my experience. And I said, I'm not going to take this drug. I'm not going to sit here and take something to where it's going to, I'm going to die earlier than I'm supposed to die. I'm not going to do it. So what I did was, I don't know why I did it, but I feel like the spirit was talking to me. It says, look at what happens if you take this drug. You know, have, you have those little small print may cause diarrhea, nausea, headaches, this. So I looked at it. I said, this is what I'm going to do. Since the doctor told me that we have to go through these protocols in order for me to get to this procedure, I'm going to let him know that I, that these symptoms is what I have. I call him up. I say, hey, I don't feel good. I, I'm taking this drug. This only maybe the, 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 the third day I call him. I'm having a lot of diarrhea. I'm having a lot of headaches. He says, come back in. I go back in there to see the same doctor, the same hospital that I don't like going to. And he says, well, let's try something different. I said, doc, I need your help. Can you give me this procedure? He says, well, we have to go through the protocol. I say, you know what? So you're not going to give me the procedure? He says, no, you know, we don't do that procedure here. And I was like, oh, so you, so in my mind, I'm like, okay, so you guys just want to push these drugs on me and keep, and keep me coming back to you guys, only suppressing the issue, but you're not going to fix me. So I said, you know what? I'm leaving. I left. I went online and I saw, I read about cardiologists, electrophysiologists. They're the ones who can give you the procedure. So I called the office and I would, I would, listen, I'm telling you, I am so highly favored 
and this is the God of his true story. I went to go see the doctor and they say, come on in on this day. He's usually here on Mondays. And I went there and the lady in the front, she said, hey, you know, did your primary care doctor send over the referral? Or, and I'm like, and in my mind, I'm, I'm like, what do I say? I don't even have a primary care doctor. I don't even go to the doctor. I go to the emergency room. So for whatever reason, I said, yeah, he sent it over. You know, you guys didn't receive it? She says, no. I said, well, I can give him a call again, but I really need to see this doctor. She said, okay, next time, just have him resend it again and go over there and sit down. You can, you can still see the doctor today. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So that worked. The doctor comes in, calls me out, calls me into his room. Hey, how you doing? Super nice guy. And if, if you ever want the information of this guy, I live here in Florida, I'll just post a comment in the comments and I'll give you the information with your email address and I'll send you his information. The guy was super nice, night and day from the other guy, night and day. But within the first five minutes, he's listening and of my symptoms. I said, like, doc, I don't feel good. I can't live a normal life. I'm always in the house. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. He says, well, I must prescribe you these pills. See how you do on them in, in the first six months, come back and we can go from there. And in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, not again, not again. So I'm quiet. He says, okay, I'll see you next time. He's one foot out the door. I said, doc, I'm dying. I don't know how I know I'm dying, but every day my heart gets Every week, my heart gets even worse and worse and worse. I know about this procedure. I know what could happen when things go wrong. He says, you do? I say, yes. I know you can die or you guys have to implant a pacemaker. Now, pacemaker, from my understanding, is if if they, take, if they do the procedure and if it's not working, they'll place like this monitoring device and whenever your heart speeds up, I think the, the pacemaker will pretty much shock your heart back into rhythm. If, and you have to run that for the rest of your life. At this point, I didn't really care, but I knew that the God that I serve, he was already going to heal me. That was my thought process because so many things were lining up for me to even see this guy. So he, come, he walks back in there and he reads my heart monitor. He downloads whatever on their uh, com of their system. He says, okay, I see here that you have atrial fibrillation. I says, yes. And he says, well, okay. Well, watch this five to 10 minute video. I'll be right back. And it'll tell you about the procedure. And, and if you still want the procedure, I'll give it to you. So I'm watching the video. He comes back within like 10 minutes. I said, sir. I've seen the video and I know about this. I know about that. I know how this heart process works. He says, you've been doing your research? I say, yes, sir. So it's almost as if, if you don't speak up and let these doctors know as far as that you, you're not ignorant, that you've done your research and you're not gonna just sit there and let them tell you anything and everything that you should do with your body because you still have a voice and only you know your body so he says this is what we're going to do i'm going to schedule you a procedure here in two months i said thank you doc so i went home and the funny thing is is that when i went home i still had the heart monitor he said still wear the heart monitor and we'll we'll monitor you they gave me a different one and the good thing about this monitor is, is that, and I'm pretty sure maybe all monitors are like this, I don't know, but whenever my heart was racing at 220 beats a minute, and it was, it was always like beating so hard to where you could feel my heart just racing out my chest. And the nurses will call me 
They'll say, hey, Cito, that's what they call me. Hey, Cito, your heart is racing really bad. You need to, are you okay? I'm like, uh, not really. Well, you need to go to the hospital because this is where it's at and you need to go. And I will always go for the most part. I will go to the hospital. And, and, and whoever invented that machine, God bless them. So leading up to the procedure, the day of the procedure, I, well, actually before the procedure, within that first two months, I was just miserable. I was, I couldn't do anything, but I was also, I was still excited on the inside that I know that there's hope for me. I knew I can get fixed. So the day of the procedure at four o'clock in the morning, I was nervous. My whole family was there. There was about eight people there, give or take. And it really got real for me when you actually have to fill up this paperwork. And they said that, fill it out. And if something happens to you while you're in the procedure, who makes the decision? Well, I said my mom my sister, my wife, then my dad. And my dad was the last person that I wanted to make the decision because prior months before that, someone rang my doorbell. And I look outside, I'm like, who is this lady in scrubs? And then, and she's like, oh, I'm here for for Cito. I'm like, that's me. He says, well, I said, who, like, I don't, who, who are you? He says, well, this person, she named my father's name, told me to come down here for an appointment with you for, this is for life insurance. I said, life insurance? And I said, wait a minute. So I, I closed the door. I called my father. I said, hey, who's this person at my door? He says, oh yeah, remember you and I talked about life insurance? Well, I, I forgot to tell you, but someone's going to come to your house and they're going to actually do a blood test and cause right now you don't, you're not technically diagnosed with anything. So we want to make sure you get you some insurance if something does happen. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. I said, well, how much is the policy? He says, oh, it's, it's over a hundred thousand. I said, a hundred thousand? He says, yeah. I said, oh, okay. So I felt like my dad was trying to, trying to, I'm not saying he was trying to put me in a grave so he can go ahead and pay off his bills. I don't know, but I just know that he wasn't going to be the first one to make that decision if something goes left. So I signed the information. We're praying. All, we're all praying together. And they said the surgery should take about four hours. They reel me off. And I'm in the surgery, surgery, surgery room with the anesthesiologist, a few other people. They're putting all these things on me. The IV excuse me, the IVs. And while he's talking to me, the anesthesiologist is saying, hey, you know, within a few minutes, you're not going to feel anything. You're going to, you're going to be under anesthesia. So I'm talking, I'm talking. And with, it felt like it was 20 seconds. I was, I was done. I wake up in the recovery room. I haven't seen my, haven't seen my family yet. And I didn't, I didn't know how to feel, but I knew that I was just tired. I was a little bit drained. And they finally reeled me in to see my family. So we're all there. We're all talking. And they're saying, hey, man, did you see Jesus? Or did you speak to God? Did, you know, did anything happen while you was under? I said, no, nothing like that happened. So the doctor comes in. And when the doctor comes in, everyone turned around. They're saying, thank you so much for the procedure. But it took at least six hours instead of four. But I was feeling like this pain right here. And I was looking and it, the I had like this little mark, like a potato in right here. I said, doc, I'm like, I'm still, I'm still like sore right here. He's like, let me tell you what happened, what was going on. When you're under the procedure of a catheter ablation, they go up through your groin. And he said that what was going on with your heart, he says it's almost as if you're looking into a campfire at nighttime. 
and you see all these sparks that's taking off like this. He said, that's what your heart was doing. He says, not only I found atrial fibrillation, AFib, which deals with the top part of the heart. He says, I also found SVT, so ventricle tachycardia, and A flutter. He says, you have you had three things going on with your heart. He said, I am so sorry that I knew it was serious, but I didn't know it was this bad. And thank you for allowing me to do this procedure because you're the only second person that I've had who had three things going on with their heart. He says, the, he says, what we have to do is we have to go up through your groin and we have to speed up your heart. And when we speed, when we sped up your heart, your blood pressure automatically crashed. And when it crashed, I had to shock you. I had to shock you at least three times to bring you back to life. And that's the reason why you have that that mark on your chest. It was like a pad mark. But he said eventually it'll go away. He says, and then also when you're under, he says, when I speed up your heart, he says, I burn that circuit of where your heart is misfiring. I burn it out completely. He said, that's the reason why it took me another couple of hours because you had a lot of things going on with your heart. He said, this, he said the surgery was successful and you should be good to go. He said, just take some Advil or no, baby aspirin. Take one baby aspirin a day and just take it easy. But also you can start walking. We'll monitor you. You still wear your heart monitor for the next month or so. So therefore, we can monitor your heart rhythms, things like that. And guys, I tell you one thing. After this procedure, I feel a thousand times better. Praise God. I feel so much better. I'm able before I couldn't even walk to the mailbox without being out of breath. Walking downstairs, I was like out of breath. And now I'm able to walk here, walk there, go on walks with my wife. We're able to go to different restaurants with no problem. I'm able to be out there in the sunlight with, without even the sun bothering me. And it feels great. It feels great. And what I would say to you guys is if you have any health issues, heart problems, do your research. Do your research, listen to other stories online you know if you have to take the medications hey that's fine but make sure you read what's going on and more about this medication that you're taking because in my in my situation I didn't want to be keep taking these medications for the rest of my life I wanted to fix the fix the problem and I feel like I feel about 98 percent 98 97 percent good before I was maybe at 20 percent. And I'm so happy and I'm so blessed to even share my story. But also along with my story, in the next video, I'm going to talk about how this led up to anxiety. And that was something else that I had to overcome after this procedure because I couldn't really figure out what was going on because after my procedure, a few months later, I started having a tough time of breathing. And I'm like, man, did he not fix me? But my heart was racing but it wasn't racing like it was before it was just so weird and I doing my research I found out is once you go through this traumatic situation or any traumatic event it can cause you to have anxiety now I didn't really believe in anxiety I'll be honest with you I didn't believe in it I thought it was just in everybody's mind which it is but my thought process process is is that there's something that happened to me which was 2012 where I almost died and it did something to my thought process and, and in my mind. And I overcame that by the grace of God. And I'll talk about that in my next video. Thank you guys so much for watching me. I'm so grateful. I'm so blessed. You guys are so blessed as well. Make sure you please subscribe to the channel. This will help us out tremendously. I'm looking forward to taking you guys on my journey because God is gonna do great things in my life. He's already done great things in my life. He's gonna do great things in your life. 
Don't give up. Remember, nothing changes if nothing changes. Don't get stuck in that rut. Great days is ahead of us. Anything that's behind us is behind us. It's in your rearview mirror because if you keep on looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to crash. You can't, you got to keep looking forward. I love you guys so much. God loves you. Thanks for watching. Let's change together. Have a blessed day.